Good afternoon uh, from Washington, D.C., and welcome to this roundtable on South Africa, Ireland, and postcolonial comparison. My name is Colin Parsons. I'm an associate professor of English at Georgetown University, and I'm the director of the Global Irish Studies Initiative, which is your host for this afternoon's conversation along with Wabash University's Department of English, Georgetown's Department of English, Georgetown's African Studies Program, and the Georgetown Humanities Initiative. Before we go any further, uh, I wanna give you a sense of how the next hour and 15 minutes or so will unfold. I will give a short outline of the stakes of this conversation and why we're having it today. And then I'll hand over to our moderator, Agata Szczeszek Brewer, who will introduce the roundtable participants. Agata is going to invite the participants to share some opening thoughts, and then she'll follow up with some questions. But after that, there will be time for questions from the audience. So please do drop questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll pick up as many questions as we can. We probably won't get to everything. And you don't have to wait until the sort of open Q&A stage to put in the questions. You can put them in at any point uh, in, during the conversation. As I say, we'll get to as many as we can. The conversation, uh, by the way, is being recorded and will be on our, available on our website in a few days. If you have to leave, if you have friends who desperately need to see it, if you want to share it, just look out on our website. And finally, today, our roundtable is the you know, final uh, opening announcements. Our roundtable is dedicated to the memory of a friend of so many people in this webinar room. Professor Harry Garuba, late professor of English and African studies at the University of Cape Town, a poet, a scholar, and as good and generous and warm a friend and colleague as anybody could hope for. Harry visited us at Georgetown in late 2019, giving a bracing lecture on African studies and the decolonization of knowledge. And he would have been one of the participants in this roundtable uh, today, given his interest in South and West African literature and in Irish literature as well. Harry uh, passed away early in 2020, and he is greatly missed by his friends, his colleagues, his students, and I will say by me uh, in particular. Go well, um, Harry. We're here today on a mission to think about the work of comparing Ireland and South Africa long acknowledged as two somewhat anomalous elements within the British Empire, and in which the history and legacy of empire loom large. The outlines of South African and Irish connections from the late 19th century uh, to today will be quite familiar to many of you here. And I'll give you a sort of a rundown of maybe the greatest hits of these. Arthur Griffith, founder of the Irish Nationalist Party Sinn Féin, spent some time in the Transvaal editing a newspaper there, and eventually supporting the Boers in the South African War. Fighting on the Boer side were to be found Major John McBride from Ireland, um, known to literary scholars here as the husband of Maud Gaughan, uh, and a little under 600 Irish and Irish Americans who joined what was called the Irish Brigade in the South African War. They had minimal impact on the war, but they loom large in the Irish self-imagination as a nation of anti-colonial fighters. There were at the same time 30,000 Irish people fighting on the British side in the South African War. And I'd sort of point you to the work of Donald and Patricia McCracken in particular, the oracles on the small but quite influential Irish community in South Africa at the turn of the last century. In 1920, Jan Smuts, at the time Prime Minister of South Africa, acted as a go-between with, I would say, very limited success in the negotiations that ended the Irish War of Independence. Later in the 20th century, Ireland became the first Western European country to support a resolution at the UN General Assembly in favor of sanctions on apartheid South Africa. This decision was propelled by the work of the Irish anti-apartheid movement under Qatar Asmal and others. Other landmarks, landmarks in anti-apartheid activism in Ireland include the protests against a tour of Ireland by the South African rugby team, the Springboks, in 1970, and the high profile refusal of supermarket workers in Ireland in the 1980s to handle South African goods leading to a ban on imports of all South African goods into Ireland. Closer to our own time, and this will come, I think, as a surprise to many South Africans on this call, current South African President Cyril Ramaphosa was a key figure in the establishment and maintenance of the peace process in Northern Ireland in the 1990s. He acted as a highly respected inspector of dumps of IRA weapons to ensure that they weren't being used. These are some of the outlines, the highlights, of a long history of anti-colonial struggle and solidarity in South Africa and Ireland. 
As Nelson Mandela said when he spoke to the Irish Parliament very shortly, a couple of months after being released, he said, we know that the joy with which you have received us and the respect for our dignity you have demonstrated come almost as second nature to a people who were themselves victims of colonial rule for centuries. But relations of solidarity are complex and uneven. And the high politics of anti-colonial action can often obscure a more textured imagination of how South African and Irish experiences are and are not com comparable. At the most obvious level, these high profile expressions of solidarity are often blind to the racial politics of African-Irish connections and the problematics of assuming that a colonial history is sufficient to build a shared decolonial future. At the same time, South African-Irish comparisons based primarily on a shared history of colonization and drawn from a colonial archive run the risk of reproducing the structures of power on which the empire was built, of retelling the same story over and over again. I want to thank Michelle Kelly, who I think is on the line here, for talking me through some of those issues uh, many years ago. Our conversation today, based on a series of essays recently published in Interventions, the Journal of Postcolonial Studies, asks how we can imagine postcolonial comparisons that are not beholden to the history of empire, but that seek to resituate the Irish South African experience outside of that single frame. Indeed, to imagine a future at the same time as retracing a past or recovering forgotten pasts. It also asks how high politics are mediated by literature and culture in ways that produce surprising and revealing connections across time and space. In the process, we seek to imagine the outline of a future post-colonial comparison that's historically and materially grounded in shared histories, and yet seeks to compare or to capture what is incomparable, what remains irreducible to the logic of sameness and of, and of analogy on which empire was built. With all that in mind, it's my pleasure now to hand you over to the moderator of our conversation to get today, my friend, my uh, co-editor of this journal issue, Professor Agatis Cheshak Brewer, who'll tell you a little bit more about the journal issue and introduce our panelists. Agata is Professor of English and John P. Collett Chair in Rhetoric at Wabash College, where she teaches courses on South African and Irish literature and on post-colonial studies and more. She's published two books, Empire and Pilgrimage and Conrad and Joyce and Critical Approaches to Joseph Conrad. And her current book, uh, is a, her current book project is a comparative study of Irish and South African literatures. I'm very grateful, Agata, to you for agreeing to moderate our panel. And of course, to Derek Attridge, to Aretha Piri, Robert Young, and Minesh Das for agreeing to take part in the panel. Agata, it is all yours. Thanks, Colin. It is my pleasure to introduce this special issue of Interventions called Geographies of Comparison, Ireland and South Africa, which um, I co-edited with Colin, um, who, uh, as he already um, introduced himself, uh, is the director of the Global Irish Studies uh, Initiative at Georgetown and associate professor. Uh, but uh, he also has plenty of publications on uh, comparative postcolonial studies, including his first book, The Ordnance Survey and Modern Irish Literature, which was awarded the American Conference for Irish Studies Robert Rhodes Prize. And he has also published two co-edited volumes, uh, one on reading culture in South Africa and uh, another on science, technology, and Irish modernism. Uh, I'm uh, happy to see uh, our contributors uh, to this volume um, in uh, the audience. Um, Kylie Thomas and Eric Lewis, Fiona McCann, Connell Parr, Matthew Etaw, and Krista Doherty contributed articles to this issue uh, that represent uh, new themes, new connections, and comparative postcolonial studies, uh, encompassing book and publication history, post uh, conflict studies, biopolitics, arch archival theory. Um, world systems theory, study of commodities and consumption, photography and image studies, and more. And the essays sketch out a broad landscape for comparative analysis of South Africa and Ireland, revisiting old archives, but also building new ones in search of new forms of comparison. 
that reveal more complex forms of uh, engagement, um, solidarity, and difference across two sides of lingering European colonialism. Um, response articles uh, in this issue uh, were uh, provided by Aretha Peary and Derek Atridge, who are also with us. Uh, they closed off the volume and, and the essays in Collins' words model ways of reading transnationally, translocally, comparatively, and differentially, while being mindful of the pitfalls and inflexibilities of uh, uh, world system theories. Um, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Derek Atridge is professor in the Department of English and Related Literature at the University of York. He was born in South Africa and some of his recent work is concerned with South African literature, including the Cambridge history of South African literature and a study of the novels of J.M. Kutsia. He is well known as a Joyce scholar, having published several books on Joyce and uh, his new co-edited volume will appear this June. Um, it's called the work of reading literary criticism in the 21st century. And it is a critical examination of the developments in the field of literary studies from the early 2000s onwards within the context of systematic problems in the humanities. Welcome, Derek. Thank you. Uh, Aretha, Aretha, Aretha Peary is Associate Professor of English at Rhodes University in South Africa. Her research broadly interrogates the intersectional interactions of race, ethnicity, culture, gender, and sexualities in um, comparative transatlantic and transnational considerations of identity uh, with a particular focus on American, African-American, and contemporary Afro-diasporic literature. She has pu published widely in the area of comparative African literature, and it's a real pleasure to welcome her to our panel today. Um, Manesh Das is senior lecturer in the Department of English at the University of Johannesburg. He has also taught English uh, and literary studies at Rhodes University and theory of literature at the University of South Africa. He has published on notions of home and belonging in South African post-apartheid writing, and also on university institutional culture. His current research focuses on methods of literary analysis and their applicability to South African cultural study. It's a real pleasure to have you here, Manesh. And Robert Young is Silver Professor and Professor of English at NYU and editor of Interventions International Journal of Postcolonial Studies. His work has been uh, founded on critical analysis of race and racism and culture, while uh, following through to a second genealogy of counter-racist movements and actions um, in other forms, particularly anti-colonialism. He is the author of many books, including White Mythologies, Writing History in the West, Colonial Desire, Hybridity and Culture, Theory and Race, post-colonialism, and empire, colony, and post-colony. His current research and writing are centered on relations between language, philosophy, and translation, with special focus on the work of Franz Fanon. Um, I will now ask the panelists to begin with a brief statement inspired by this special issue of interventions after which I will ask uh, a couple of questions and then open up the floor uh, to the audience's questions. We will begin with um, Aretha Peary. I was hoping you might choose Derek to speak, but we'll start with me. Um, yeah, um, opening statement, I think, from my reading of the um, journal, certainly a very inspiring journal, um, brings up very important and uh, 
interesting issues with regard to South African and Irish relations. And I think one of the things that I found quite interesting was the interdisciplinary uh, methodology that was used in this instance and how it actually shines a light on the very different ways in which we can approach the topic. Um, of course, politics is always pretty central to the South African Irish um, dynamic, but I think I quite enjoyed the ways in which all of the contributors came at it at very different angles. So in that respect, I think um, the introductory note with regard to looking at revisiting the architecture of um, comparative post-colonial discussions regarding these two nations um, has certainly been successfully achieved. Thank you, Aretha. Uh, we'll move on to Derek. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, when Colleen asked me if I would be willing to write a response to the articles in this special issue, I was very pleased to accept uh, and look forward to reading them and they were a, a great pleasure. And yes, like, like uh, Aretha, I was struck by the variety of approaches and the variety of um, insights that, that resulted. I also found myself thinking about the comparative nature of post-colonial studies, that if, if there is such a thing as a, a field, an academic field called post-colonial studies, there must be some degree of commonality between all those nations and peoples who have experienced colonialism and uh, are presumably experiencing in some form or other post-colonialism, if not neo-colonialism. So um, it therefore follows, I suppose, that any two examples of such nations or peoples would throw up uh, interesting and illuminating um, links, connections, um, sympathetic vibrations, and so on. Uh, the question then becomes, why South Africa and Ireland, of all the multiple um, pairings that one could imagine, what is so particularly interesting about this one? Um, and the question becomes particularly um, challenging if you think of how different the colonial histories of the two nations in question are. They both go back a very long way, but they are um, very, very different in their, in their configurations. So um, that led me to think about the way in which the contributions to this collection um, dealt not just in very interesting, intriguing, specific material uh, connections between the two countries and the two histories, but uh, what kind of light this might throw on more general issues uh, regarding post-colonialism and the comparative, the, the essentially and necessarily comparative nature of post-colonial studies. What, what I mean is that even though one might, as a post-colonialist, one might be invested in a particular uh, anti-colonial struggle and its aftermath, uh, there is always underlying that if one thinks of oneself as in some sense a post-colonialist or post-colonial student, um, underlying it is some notion of shared and comparative examination. Thanks. Thank you, Derek. Uh, Manesh. Thank you. Um, so uh, first I just wanna thank um, uh, Agatha and Colleen and um, all my fellow panelists for uh, inviting me to this, uh, this session. Um, I, I just want to kind of share a small uh, anecdote. In 2015, I was teaching uh, at the university that Aretha currently teaches at, at um, the university currently known as Rhodes, and it was just as the Rhodes Must Fall protests had begun at the University of Cape Town, it became clear that these protests were going to spread to other campuses. The work of organizing um, the protests at um, UCAR um, was mostly um, handled through a group called the Black Students Movement, which was uh, a, a movement that drew very consciously on uh, 
the black consciousness philosophy um, of, of people like Steve Beagle. Um, and I attended one of the early meetings of this group in which some of the white students um, expressed concern about the name of the group, feeling that it implicitly kind of excluded them. And uh, this just ties in well with um, Agata's um, article in um, the special issue, which also um, looks at an instance where a kind of um, connection between uh, America and South Africa came through, because I'm thinking of similar kind of uh, liberal ideas of, um, of colorblindness that have um, risen up around the Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, in any event, um, there was a, a student who responded to the, uh, the concerns of the white students in, in the group. And he mentioned uh, the way in which Irish people had been um, kind of racialized and othered um, in the late 19th and early 20th century. And he concluded that um, this, the group needed to move beyond thinking of blackness in terms of somatic features and rather to consider it as a political category which required political action. And I was very struck by this moment uh, and I still am because in a time of fraught student activism, the, the BSM drew on historical connections between Irish and black people to include white students in protests that were designed at least in principle um, to address concerns about for working class black students. So uh, it seems to me that what happened in uh, Makanda, what was then Grahamstown in 2015 is instructive because it allows us to, um, to think about the conditions from which an invitation to solidarity are made. Um, in this case, the conditions were uh, students with relatively little power, including students with a great deal more power. Um, and I, I was thinking of this in comparison to the kind of um, mobilization of, um, uh, of solidarity uh, through the, um, the uh, <coughs> Irish um, Brigade Monument that uh, Christo Doherty writes so well about, the way in which the apartheid state and now um, the African separatists in Irania have mobilized that idea of um, Irish South African um, anti-colonial um, uh, a solidarity. And I think what my, my, my thought when I read through the special issue was that in many ways, this contemporary moment in which young students were willing to invoke a solidarity uh, between uh, black, black um, people in South Africa and Irish people um, during the colonial um, agitation, it spoke of a lived experience of solidarity that could uh, perhaps be built upon. And um, I think I just want to kind of open with that. And, and then also, uh, I, I just wanted to speak to the ways in which that kind of allows for, while I'm very grateful to be invited to speak here, I think there are invitations that can come from the global south to um, Ireland and to uh, you know, scholars doing this kind of work and, and I, I can maybe speak about the kind of invitations that we could think about in, that, in those terms later. I also just wanted to kind of reiterate what has already been said, which is that I think the, the, the special issue itself is, is buried in its methodology. It is um, interesting in its breadth. I learned so much that I really didn't know and possibly perhaps should have known. Um, I was struck by the articles that dealt with African literature and the ways in which they uh, allowed South African literature to be uh, thought of in very different terms. I was struck by the ways in which comparative work between Ireland and South African literature was done, and also with the ways in which that work navigated um, what Colleen Parsons calls the asymmetries of, of the relationship. I thought that was done very carefully and with a great deal of rigor, and um, yeah, I just thought the, the breadth and, and scope of the collection was absolutely interesting, if of course incomplete. Thank you, Manesh. Um, I'd like to um, invite Robert to say a few words. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not a contributor to this issue. I, I'm the editor of the journal, uh, but I'd like to thank uh, Agatha and Colleen for putting this great issue together. And it was a real pleasure working with you both, with the contributors, uh, over some time putting it all together. I think it's really interesting and unusual issue that the, the idea of, of looking at Ireland, South Africa outside the 
the typical framework of empire is 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 particularly interesting in that the links that that uh, contributors made to <coughs> excuse me um, uh, other kinds of campaigns like anti-apartheid movement and so forth uh, were really put the whole relationship into into a different configuration i think so the idea of comparing colonies is a really interesting one derek's already touched on that and i suppose i could say as a sort of uh, <coughs> follow on from from derek's remarks that uh, to me all colonies are the same and all colonies are different and it, it's it's within that scenario that that any uh, analysis of any particular colony uh, should take place, but also, of course, uh, comparisons between the situations of different colonies. But what this brings out, I think, this issue brings out uh, implicitly is, is, the, is the degree to which, uh, as historians, uh, uh, Colleen mentioned Donald, Patricia McCracken, who are the kind of big historians of the Irish uh, South Africa connection. Uh, what it brings out is 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 the how interesting these, as it were, south-south uh, relations during the period of empire really really were, and how how active they were. And obviously, South Africa has this links to Ireland. There's obviously links to India as well. So you see these different configurations uh, at, at play. I would say that I do find Ireland to, uh, to be unique in 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 not just because it was itself and different, but it, as a colony, it was unique in, in the sense that it was the colony that, that was most able to develop an international network of anti-colonial activism. And that, that's one of the things I find very fascinating. But obviously, the IRB and its connections <coughs> to the US uh, uh, and uh, Irish activists in Australia, Canada, and so forth throughout the period of empire uh, make it make it significantly different from from many other colonies, shall, shall, shall we say? Uh, so much so that you've got things like, uh, for example, the the event of the Irish International in 1922, where where Irish people uh, met in Paris uh, to discuss the Irish situation, and, and there you had people not only from from the U.S., Canada, South Africa, but also places like Chile and Bolivia. So Ireland really is unique in, in many ways, but just the sheer organizational skills, if you like, of the Fenians in developing this international network in the days before the internet and so forth, I think are, are really uh, remarkable. But within that, of course, what's different is in fact, the scenario of the Ireland uh, South Africa connection, because uh, as we know that the sort of push in that direction went not to agitating against British imperial rule in South Africa, but to alliance with, with the Boers and all the complications that that, that, that uh, developed. So, so the, in that sense, even from an internationalist perspective, so to speak, uh, our island South Africa relations are, are very specific. And as I think this issue and indeed your article, Agatha, brings out very well is, you know, the complications, particularly from a modern day perspective of, of of that alliance, uh, which, as it were, you know, it's typical of the past. It doesn't. The past never quite fits the present, as you might like. You might want it to, you know, the wrong people with the wrong people and so forth, because it's it's, it's different. Uh, but uh, look, looking at that and sh showing the degree to which that's the case, I think, is a real strength of this issue. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to connect uh, what uh, Manesh said about uh, blackness as a political category um, in his uh, description of this very moving um, moment um, where, if I understand the moment correctly, um, uh, what happens is white students or white people demand to be centered in an anti-colonial or anti-racist movement um, and to take space um, there. Uh, I'd like to connect that to Aretha's um, response essay um, in which, uh, Aretha, you recall the um, unsettling experience in Belfast, one that makes you ponder the problems of being assimilated into a transatlantic history in ways that are 
many ways um, uh, misguided. Um, and, and also what that tells us about the, you know, the, the comparative studies in, in general and what, what political imbalance might actually introduce into them. Aretha, would you mind uh, mentioning a few words about your experience in Belfast? Um, okay, well, let me start by saying my, my experience of Belfast in itself is quite um, unsettling. Um, I remember coming back from that trip feeling, and, and I think I say it in the issue, Belfast felt to me like a city that time had forgot. Um, this very many political monuments to the, the troubles um, and almost the sense that you are not to forget. Um, and walking around um, Shankill Road, et cetera, et cetera, being absolutely fascinated because, I mean, living in South Africa, I think probably because it was a small space, it is a city as opposed to wide expanse of country, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was quite intimidated to be confronted by so many political images of the troubles and to be constantly reminded that this is the history of the city. Um, and um, yes, being being greeted by two young men with the phrase Amandla um, and being quite bemused because we couldn't actually, it, it was obvious they saw us and identified us in a particular narrative. Um, you know, two black females, we, we were probably, I don't recall seeing any other black females walking around the area. Um, and they felt compelled to shout out some sort of solid solidarity. Um, and we kind of hesitantly waved back you know, as one do start explaining that you're not South African and you know that's not your history. <laughs> and so um, it, it was an interesting encounter and unsettling in the sense of the ways in which, um, as I say in, the, in my response, the ways in which I was identified um, and the ways in which people embody particular narratives that aren't necessarily true. Um, and that need to, to assimilate us into that particular context actually also felt like a moment of othering. Um, it, 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 was, it would be dishonest of me to say, you know, I felt at home or I felt as if I was being accepted. I think if anything, there's a sense of, you know, not being seen for who one was, but of course, you know, the circumstances don't call for that anyway. So um, yeah, I, having read this special issue and, and being invited to, to give a response, I was um, impelled to, to think about my own experience of, of England, and what the comparisons themselves might be between South Africa and, um, and Ireland. And I think on both sides, certainly, very politicized histories and um, the notion that you dare not forget. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll let other people speak to that. There's so much more I'd like to say, but um, I think I'll keep quiet for now and let other people join in. Yeah, I think it, it, it's um, certainly, it, it echoes what I think uh, Manesh says in, in his introduction to reading post-apartheid whiteness. Uh, Manesh, you say that whiteness remains enmeshed in normative practices uh, of power and, and rooted in material conditions of inequality and ongoing relations of social injustice. And so that that reflects on, on post-colonial comparative exercises as well, right? That may include, say, Irish and say, Scottish literatures uh, compared to South African literatures. Uh, Manesh, would you mind um, elaborating on that, um, uh, on those kind of uh, inequalities and uh, pitfalls of, of comparative studies um, that are rooted sure. in, in those normative pra practices? So, um, yeah, I, th I think um, the, the special issue, and particularly um, Colleen's introduction, talks about 
uh, the necessity of, of, of thinking about race when, when we do this kind of work, uh, particularly comparative work with um, South Africa and Ireland. And I think that's important. Um, in terms of the sort of comparative work in, in the realm of kind of literature and culture, um, I think what I, I suppose I'm thinking about more and more is just that in South African literature, race can't be ignored. It doesn't, it almost doesn't matter what you write, unless you're writing something really very conservative, it would be very hard to write about South Africa and not deal with race. And I'm not sure that's true of, 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 of the literature, I mean, of some of the literature coming out of Ireland and Scotland. So I suppose what I wonder about this kind of comparative work is how do we address that divide where Irish and, and Scottish literature, for instance, has at least the possibility or the choice to uh, render whiteness normative by, by not addressing race, um, where South African uh, fiction doesn't. And then also what happens when, when um, <clears throat> particularly Irish fiction becomes self-reflexive of its whiteness, how that perhaps opens up space for uh, discussions and for comparative work that might be more productive. Thank you, Manesh. Um, it makes me think of uh, um, Derek's response to the essays included in this issue uh, about the asymmetries uh, in literary influences between Ireland and South Africa. And uh, Manesh, you mentioned something really interesting about uh, sort of the, the types of invitations that uh, might come from the Global South to scholars in Ireland and elsewhere. Um, which uh, I, I think I would love uh, for you to elaborate uh, on this, um, but, but also uh, uh, then we could possibly move to, to Derek's response that talks about those asymmetries in literary uh, influences between Ireland and South Africa and, and what they tell us, what specifically they tell us about imbalances of power in contemporary comparative studies. Um, so, uh, Manesh, would you mind elaborating on those uh, possible um, types of invitations that might come from the Global South and not in reverse? So, um, well, I suppose, again, it, it related to that experience of having um, watched um, Black students extend solidarity to white students for political, uh, for, for really urgent political reasons. And in, in reading this collection of essays, um, of articles, which again, I thought were excellent. Um, one of the, the small sort of gaps that I noticed was that recent black South African writing was underrepresented in, uh, even in English, uh, black writing in English was underrepresented in this um, kind of archive that uh, you are trying to kind of create. And so my, my invitation for future scholarship is an invitation to try to bring that writing into this versioning scholarship and this versioning archive and to see what is what can be produced through it, the ways in which both that literature but also um, Irish literature can be thought anew in light of, um, of, 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 of the new kind of uh, black writing coming out of South Africa. And, and I'm, I'm thinking also in particular of the ways in which um, Matthew Ito's article and Eric Lewis's article allow us to contextualize and historicize um, canon making and particularly modernism. Uh, because I think one of the difficulties with this writing is that it doesn't really um, fit into that, that, that canon. It doesn't really, it's not legible within that canon. And so um, I'm interested to see what can be done once we destabilize that canon. And if we can then include writing that would be otherwise illegible. Thank you, Manesh. Um, Derek, uh, could we think for a moment about those um, inequalities and uh, asymmetries um, and, and what they tell us about the, um, about the larger question of comparative um, post-colonial studies? I mean, I'm thinking of uh, of your seminal text, the semi-colonial Joyce, and you know one of the earliest uh, analyses of uh, the sort of 
semi-peripheral status of Irishness. Um, and uh, how thinking about the periphery is uh, in a way a limited uh, sort of parameter to, to talk about these, these two literatures, Irish and South African literatures. Um, especially uh, as we think about uh, the, the fact that, I mean, our, our issue is limited to Anglophone South African output and, uh, and therefore um, ignores the remaining 10 official languages in, in South Africa. Um, yeah, what, what do you think, Derek? Can I just start by reminding us of that comment made by Jimmy Rabbit in um, in the in the commitments in um, um, Roddy Doyle's novel The Commitments. Some of you at least will know it's, it's a rather famous comment. The Irish are the blacks of Europe, he says, and the Dubliners are the blacks of Ireland, and the North Dubliners are the blacks of Dublin. So um, say it say it now and say it loud. We are black and we are proud. A nice identification. Uh, of the Irish working class with with um, black struggles elsewhere. Um, yeah, but the bigger question of asymmetries, I was very pleased that uh, Coileen in his introduction stressed the, the asymmetries visible in the, in the history, uh, both political and cultural uh, histories of um, Ireland, South Africa. Uh, and I was struck too by the, the kind of switch in direction. Um, We've already, in in his introduction, talked about the very well-known instance of the Irish nationalist um, support of, and 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 to some degree, um, side by side fighting with the the Boers in the uh, South African War, 1989 to 1902, um, where the the asymmetry was all on the side of the Irish um, exploitation of, particularly Arthur Griffith's exploitation of the, the Boer struggle, whereas in South Africa, as far as one can tell, the um, Irish nationalist movement didn't make much impact. Whereas if we look culturally, of course, the asymmetry is all in the other direction, that um, because of Ireland's and 20th century Ireland's Extraordinarily, um, extraordinary uh, visibility uh, in in the sphere of literature. Uh, South Africa, South African writers could never be in, in anything other than a subsidiary uh, position. So the influence of Joyce, for instance, is huge on um, on the Sestachers, as Matthew Ito points out, on the Sestachers. Uh, Afrikaans writes in the 1960s, and then much later, uh, Anglophone writing catches up a, a, a little. But I think clearly these asymmetries reflect different kinds of, of um, not just power relations, but visibility relations, let's say. The, the Boer struggle became um, a, a propaganda vehicle, and, and Arthur Griffith, above all, in the United Irishmen, pushed this as hard as he could. Uh, so it becomes not not just a question of um, material um, asymmetry, material I I I um, differences, but of cultural and um, ideological, uh, ideational differences. Um, in in both cases, I think um, the the spectacle of the plucky Boers fighting the might of the British Empire on the one hand and the spectacle of the um, Irish modernists challenging the, the, the might of the um, English tradition of the, the Victorian novel. Um, parallel cases, but in inversely related. It's, it's really interesting uh, because thinking of the asymmetries in terms of the linguistic um, gaps and erasures, um, you know, our issue is limited in, in time and, and, and space, obviously, but uh, it, it does not invite Irish language uh, literature and then does not invite, uh, as I mentioned, the, the 
10 remaining offic official languages in South Africa. And so I'm thinking of Jim Katsia's uh, um, comment when he said that, it, that English liberated him from the narrow worldview of the Af Afrikaans language. But then he also said at a festival in Colombia that the hegemony of English language, um, mentioned London and New York as well, in the realm of global literature has to end. Um, and so I wonder about the blind spots that we should be aware of when engaging in comparative studies. Um, and, and I'm gonna just uh, open it up to anybody who wants to answer uh, this question. Shall I take a shot? Sure, yes, Arisa, thank you. Um, I, well, for me, I think this is one of the things I found quite um, interesting about the, the special issue is that where we, we see its limitations and, and the issues that aren't addressed or, or you know, implicitly and explicitly not addressed, I think those are particularly generative moments. And I think that's what I found quite fascinating. I mean, um, Fiona McCann's article with regard to prison writing um, and how that's seen as an alternative literary form, I think is, you know, this is, this is a field that is being explored. But when I think in, in my own um, educational upbringing, when I think of the Irish canon, and the South African canon, I immediately think white male. So to have, you know, an article that opens up that space with regard to, you know, the, the writing that was produced by women um, at the time, I think is absolutely fascinating. Um, I wish more had been said. So I think when I say it's extremely generative, I think for me, these blind spots actually left me wanting more. And, and that's what the special issue did for me was to indicate that there are so many more ways in which this can be approached. Um, the the um, articles on um, the monuments, I found extremely illuminating and theater, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but again, issues to do with, with how history shifts. Um, history is not static. and coming from a, a country where, you know, we are privy to name changes pretty uh, religiously. Um, I mean, Manesh has just said to you, it's the University of um, currently known as Rhodes and we've now been called Makanda and I'm not going to try and pronounce what Port Elizabeth is because that name has since changed. Um, but it does, it, it says a lot about our investment in history. Um, and again, I mean, I, I really, I think what one of the things I, I think Coyland did a great job in, in his introduction. I mean, he uses the word architecture. And I think that's what the, the special issue does. It presents to you the varieties of architecture. So you have these very ingrained technical structural premises that we work on, but how can we look at things differently? Um, reading, you know, um, the, the article on, um, I think it was Kylie Thompson's article on um, the, the black exiles in Ireland was extremely fascinating. Um, again, something I, I'm not particularly um, well versed in, but having been to Belfast and seen, for example, how many of the murals are actually dedicated to, to black um, activists says a lot about you know, the influence of black politics in Irish history. Um, so yeah, fascinating. Thank you. I have a question from the audience. Uh, I'm going to ask Robert to, if, if Robert responds to this question. Uh, the question is from Patrick Flaherty. Uh, what are your thoughts on the role Ireland can play versus the role it has played so far in the 21st century when it comes to the Israeli occupation of Palestine. This seems like one of the most important anti-colonial issues currently, and Ireland is in an interesting position having connections to the US with Joe Biden while the US is 
Israel's greatest supporter and financer. Okay, um, <laughs> tricky hot topic. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, well, it's an interesting question and it's an in interesting question for Ireland, actually. Uh, obviously, the Irish-American connection is very live and there are things that go both ways that, you know, that's politically, that's, a, that, that, that's a, an ongoing connection that actually hasn't diminished really since the 19th century. Uh, <clears throat> but I don't think it's going to be very, uh, it's possible for it to be very effective in this, in this case. That's not actually, but Alan can obviously can do what it can, but I don't think Joe Biden is really going to you know, shift his position <laughs> thanks to any Irish intervention. That's my, that would be my guess, you know. Um, I think what Ireland can do much more is within the EU and, you know, the EU is a, is a political bloc that, that actually takes up uh, political positions and particularly economic and cultural positions. Uh, Ireland can really um, move uh, or attempt and should attempt to, to push the EU in, in its uh, very ambivalent positions over that. Uh, conflict. Uh, it kind of tries to support both sides, which I don't think is really acceptable. Uh, but it's, a, you know, it's, it, uh, they, they stand on the fence, giving money to Palestinians, but also supporting the Israelis. So uh, Ireland could do much more, I think, in, in highlighting the, the uh, contradictions of the EU position there. I could say something, just, uh, maybe just add about language, because you asked that question about language, and I see there's a question about language too. Um, uh, I think this whole idea of, of well, Katsir's idea that the, you know the dominance of English must must end. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Fine to say that, um, but of course he, uh, as 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 we know, as he was quoted, said uh, <laughs> that you know, moving into English was a was a liberation, and that's something that I think is very interesting in linguistic terms, uh, certainly of the 20th century, of, of writers who move into another language as a liberation. And obviously there, there are many of them. Uh, Beckett would be, would be obviously a, a great example. Um, uh, uh, typically people move from uh, what are technically called minor languages in, into major languages or across languages as in, case, in the case of, uh, of uh, Beckett. Uh, there are very few examples of people who move the other way. Ngugi Wathiongo is, the, is the, the, the big example, and it's, it's interesting to discuss how effective that, that has actually been. And uh, the, some of the ironies of, of the fact that uh, uh, a lot of languages were created by missionaries and so forth in, in script form in the 19th century and are actually colonial products themselves, I think, complicates the, the whole dynamics there. But the, the idea that, that actually languages are sites of freedom, I think is very important, certainly from a, from a literary point of view, and that you can achieve forms of political freedom by moving out of the ideological framework of one language in, into another. I think that's something that we, we could explore much more. Thank you, Robert. Uh, yes, I mean, Ngugi Wathiongo calls language the war zone, right? Um, and so there's a little space for, uh, I suppose, collaboration or fluid shifting, uh, if we think of, a, 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 of language choices that way. Um, but I'm also thinking of the languages that, are, that have been kind of in the background um, even in, in, uh, in American literature, right? Native American languages that are disappearing um, and are not studied in greater detail in comparative uh, contexts um, as well. Um, following up on the question about Palestine and Ireland and South Africa, um, I wonder um, what, what the benefit, what's the benefit of triangulating you know, uh, things like white supremacist undercurrents and, and national narratives of Ireland and South Africa, or, um, you know, what do we gain or risk by adding a source such as the, say the KKK uh, in the United States it's, uh, and its uh, influence on the um, erection of um, Confederate monuments um, 
in the 20th century in the United States. And, and you know, ultra, ultra nationalist factions elsewhere. Um, the article about the monuments, um, you know, brings up uh, really um, like contemporary issues of uh, commemorating um, history. And, uh, and conversely, how do we discuss movements such as Black Lives Matter, Roads Must Fall, Peace Must Fall without blunting the edges of real historical and cultural differences? Um, I, I wonder if um, one of the panelists could, could think about uh, these triangulations. I, I mean, I know that um, Aretha's um, expertise is, uh, it spans African diaspora um, and it includes um, publications on um, African American literature as well as Afro diasporic literature elsewhere. Uh, perhaps Aretha could um, could begin uh, responding to to this question with a triangulation of um, of those um, undercurrents in national narratives. Um. I think it's an interesting question and I was actually going to let Manesh take this one <laughs> because if we're talking white supremacist history I think um, Manesh certainly has a better grasp on that than I would but um, yeah it, it's an interesting question because it's something I've not actually thought of with regard to the triangulation the triangulation but um, I mean for me just just going back to the the notion of of uh, languages I mean, one of the things that has become quite prominent in, in my studies of African diasporic fiction, for example, is, you know, the, 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 that even within the, the Anglophone, you know, English literature, there are very many forms of English. Um, and I think uh, Chinua Achebe talks about that. So, you, you know, you've got the Wugi Wationgo on one side and Chinua Achebe on the other one saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to make English make work for me and I'm, I'm going to inflect it with, with my cultural resonances. Um, and um, I mean, admittedly, again, I mean, one of the things I say about the special issue is I, I found one thing I found quite striking was precisely that, that the focus was on English, um, where again, well, a particular kind of English. I mean, it could have been pushed a little bit further with regard to, okay, we can't get out the English trap, but, you know, what kinds of variations of, of English? And I think here about what Manesh was talking about, the kinds of literature that doesn't fit into the canon. Um, so in that way, I think one of the, the blind spots and, and the risks is to reinforcing the architecture upon which you know, these comparative studies are built um, and the ways in which we understand post-colonialism. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not sure, I don't, I probably haven't answered anything to do with triangulation. <laughs> I answered what I could. Uh, thank you, Aretha. Manesh, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, thank you, Agata. Thank you, Aretha. I, I suppose one of the things, it sounds like we're talking constantly about the gaps in the scholarship. And I feel like we haven't done enough credit to the wonderful scholarship that has been done. One of the things I suppose another gap is, is um, the way in which new media is uh, uh, changing our habits of consumption and also the, 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 the so, yeah, socio-historical landscape. Um, and I'm thinking particularly of the way in which new media is now uh, transmitting sort of uh, white nationalist thinking and white supremacist thinking and particularly the way in which that information uh, is coming from America and being transmitted to places like South Africa. Um, so I suppose in thinking these things, one of the things that occurs to me is just the, the way in which the connections aren't just um, historical, they're also being reanimated right now. And they're being, re re so the way in which this, this information is, being disseminated through this media, but it's also, of course, being consumed differently in different um, different sites. So, for instance, we have you know the Afri Forum, which is a very uh, far right um, organization in South Africa, meeting members of the the far right in America and having these kind of creating these kind of transnational connections, and that's a different kind of um, you know comparative work that we could possibly do as well. 
Thank you, Manesh. Um, I have a question from Ryan Connor, a student at GU. Um, if we're thinking about uh, usable pasts in anti-colonial struggles, do the problems of comparison between South Africa and Ireland, particularly involving race, as many of the panelists have mentioned, render it impossible to create any sense of a shared usable past between South Africa and Ireland? Um, and as a follow up, in other words, do the problems of these connections outweigh whatever political use they might serve? I'm going to ask Derek to respond to that one and then any other panelists, if, if you want to follow, follow up, please do. Thanks, Raja. Um, can I just say something first about language since we were talking about that and um, it does relate to my thoughts about the necessary, necessary um, comparative nature and generalizing nature of post-colonial studies. Um, I don't think you editors should beat yourselves up about being um, solidly ang anglophonic in the special issues since if we're talking about Ireland and South Africa, English is clearly the, the only linguistic medium that will work uh, between the two countries. Um, I don't think the Irish language ever had much influence directly on South African writers or thinkers, and I'm not sure that um, any of the indigenous languages of South Africa had much purchase in, in Ireland. But of course, that leads to the question of translation. Translation is, and I know Robert will agree, absolutely central to any thought of post-colonial studies uh, as um, something which expands beyond a single people or a single culture. Um, question of usable past, I, I think it's, it's not at all the case that um, the problems and, and asymmetries uh, that we've highlighted in the discussion and in the, in the issue mean that there's no, no political value in, um, in, in, in the memory of the, the cultural memory of these moments of connection. I think on the contrary, the, the, um, the, the very fact that we are able to discuss uh, the ways in which South Africa and Ireland have become mutually entangled are vivid illustrations of the value of continuing to explore and delve into um, the histories that make us what we are and put us in the position that we are now. Um, yes, there are many blind alleys and, and um, false uh, trails and um, wild goose chases, but uh, I think the lessons are immensely valuable and uh, should be continually pursued. I, can I add something just quickly? I mean, I, just thinking about the, the usable past, I, I think what's so great about that history is that you have the, the Irish making alliances, you know, where they could and politically being most effective and so forth, which now conjures up problems because we now think about race differently from the way they were thinking about it at that time. But, you know, to the credit of Ireland, uh, you know, it's done amazing things. And it's since Ireland became its own country, I mean, what's been so important is that it's remained neutral. And there are very few neutral countries on earth. And it, it, it really puts in a very specific position, I think. And, and what, to, to, to the credit of uh, the Irish, what happened after the Second World War uh, and uh, as, as Ireland uh, kind of moved into a different era, as a post-colony rather than as a colony, although we're accepting Northern Ireland, however you want to describe that, um, is that you know they change sides. So that so the support, as the as the article on uh, Irish uh, anti-apartheid movement shows so so well, you know people were absolutely hundred percent there, right? You know working class people. It wasn't just a, a, a movement of intellectuals and so forth. So I don't think there's anything you know embarrassing about the history. The history of the nineteenth century was. The 19th century, uh, and people made alliances uh, where they could in the most effective way. Uh, but what's what's different about Ireland, and probably maybe 
you know, I can't think of another example of, of where where the, the sort of shift has has been so significant of shifting from support for the Boers in the 19th century uh, to anti-apartheid movement and being at the forefront of that movement in, in the 20th. So, you know, that's a great history and, and not one to be embarrassed about, I think. Um, sorry, can I just add something as well? So the, the, I would just add that, I suppose when we talk about usability, we should ask to what end, right? So um, usable for what end? If the usability of it were to establish some kind of bland solidarity, then no, perhaps the history might be too tenuous. But if the usability is to point to um, the complexity of these entanglements and to point to um, the ways in which differently historically situated and geographically situated sites have uh, become enmeshed, then the usability or the utility of it is immense, really. Thank you, Manesh. Um, since we um, have only seven, six minutes left, um, I will ask the final question um, that hopefully will bring all these strands uh, together. Um, uh, in Robert Young's response to PMLA's The End of Postcolonial Theory, um, Robert once asked, what remains of the postcolonial? Has it already perished, leaving only its earthly relics, forgotten books, abandoned articles floating in cyberspace, remnants of yellowing conference programs? Um, and taking into account that postcolonial theory um, is sort of inherently comparative in, in many ways. Uh, so almost a decade later, what is the answer? We, which you should tell us which sequence to, to speak. Um, Robert, uh, would you like to start? Okay, well, of course, <laughs> already, already answered my own question <laughs> in, in that article. So uh, would I give a different answer now? I, th I think uh, what what's very interesting uh, is is the way that that uh, there's been a, you know a push within the whole remit of of, of, of postcolonial thinking, should we say very broadly, uh, for a form of current activism, which is now goes by the name of decolonial, uh, or de decoloniality. Uh, and obviously that has special uh, attachments to indigeneity and uh, for South America and so forth, but, but it's also spread much more broadly. And I, I like the way that actually what's happened is uh, that postcolonial thinking has just to a you know, significant degree moved out of academia, moved out of studies of authors who said the wrong thing in the past and so forth. Uh, and actually it's about uh, exactly what I was trying to talk about in that article, which is looking at the way that, that uh, uh, institutions, social practices, all forms of everyday thinking are actually still embedded in, in colonial uh, structures from, from the past and trying to shift those to to create a more just and equitable world so uh, that's where that's where it's gone and that's what's happening and i think that's great thank you robert uh derek would would you like to respond to that yeah i applaud what robert has to say and i suppose the other side of the coin is the stealthy or not so stealthy advance of world literature which um has been busy trying to elbow post-colonial studies out of the picture for a while now. Um, I find it a very worrying development and I hope that post-colonial post-colonialists and decolonialists around the world can, um, can resist this, this push because it seems to me that um, world literature for all its value in, um, in some, some types of, of world literary studies its value in um, recovering um, marginalized literatures and in um, engaging in a conversation uh, across new new boundaries. It seems to me to to have lost so much of what is important in postcolonial studies, which which is exactly that activist element and its connection with ongoing and very real 
material struggles. So um, let's not let world literature dominate the picture. Thank you, Aretha. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I guess I'll, I'll add to the cynicism and, and speak a little bit about um, the emergent decolonial theory, theory which, um, yeah, um, coming from a continent where decolonial theory is, is quite prevalent um, in, in terms of how we teach and are asked to, to read scholarship, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, um, I think I'm a bit ambivalent about decolonial, decolonial theory. Um, I guess like um, Manesh asked the question, you know, about things being usable um, and to what end? I guess that becomes my question. And, and I think it just ties up with all the things we've been talking about with regard to language, indigeneity, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think we all understand the premise of decolonial theory and we applaud the premise, but I think um, as with very many other theories, post-colonial theory, world literature included, you know, there, there are nuances, asymmetries, idiosyncrasies involved that, um, yeah, as we've all been saying, very many blind spots to which we would also need to attend when we're punting yet another theory as more pertinent and, and usable. Thank you. Manesh. Um, yes, I don't have much to say beyond what's already been said. I, I certainly don't think um, either decolonial theory or post-colonial theory is dead, but I do think it needs to evolve. Um, I think it needs to be constantly responsive. And that's, I think, why both Derek and, and Robert have spoken about the importance of, of activism, because that connects the theory to um, you know, the grassroots movements and to the, the plight of, of people. And I think, well, just we were speaking before this sort of, sort of kicked off about the discrepancy in, in vaccine rollout in the global north and the global south. That is a very real case of why we need post-colonial theory and why we need decolonial theory as well. Thank you all so much. Um, I really um, enjoyed our conversation and I hope the audience did as well. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, pick up the special issue of interventions on South Africa and Ireland. And let's continue um, uh, talking about uh, both the exceptionalism of cultures and, and, and patterns and connections uh, between cultures and, and ways to reconcile um, you know, two modes of interrogation and, and kind of ways to find um, commonalities without blunting the edges of real and important differences um, between literatures and cultures. Uh, thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Agata. Uh, thank you, Robert, Derek, Minesh, Aretha. Um, uh, and uh, for me, it's, uh, it's just time to say good afternoon here from Washington, DC, from York and New York, from Johannesburg, uh, Makanda, and uh, Crawfordsville, Indiana. Is that where it is, uh, Agata? I'm from Crawfordsville, Indiana. It's been a pleasure having you join us. Um, this has been, for me, as somebody who edited this issue, this has been an incredibly stimulating conversation. And I think the, the one thing that I've been picking up uh, throughout this entire conversation is what sort of Manesh, the note that Manesh ended on, but also Robert and, and, and Derek and Aretha, um, is the sense of the value of colonial comparison or post-colonial comparison being in how we understand how it produces a future, not how it talks about a past. Um, and, and where that future comes from and where the questions of that future come from. And I think sort of the, the value for Irish studies and for Ireland in particular is understanding theory, in understanding the very idea of theory from the South um, and realizing that the geolocatedness of knowledge, where we learn, what we learn and how we learn it um, has, a has a deep impact on how we, produce, how we produce knowledge and how we produce the future. And unless we are engaging with the global South in the same ways as, we, as we're engaging with a sort of a, a long history of knowledge in the global North, we can't imagine a future. So on that note, uh, on that happy note, um, I'll leave you. Thanks for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have all of you. And again, thanks uh, Robert, Aretha, Minesh, Derek, Agata, 
have a good afternoon, good evening. And um, from here in Georgetown uh, Global Irish Studies, we'll see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>